Welcome everyone to The Stateless Atheist, where religion, politics, and society collide. Before we begin, I want to apologize for my absence. I will try to upload on a more steady schedule, but I am trying a few new things. Like, first off, I am no longer showing my face in the videos. I feel until I get a better camera and a teleprompter, it degrades the quality of the video. I think this new format looks more professional and will enable me to create new videos at a quicker rate. Please like and subscribe. I'm a very small channel at the moment, but I hope to keep putting out good content. The more interaction I have with subscribers, the more encouraged I get to put out new videos. Well, let's begin. Today I'm going to talk about Jeffrey Friedan's morphological conception of ideology. But before we can discuss Friedan's view, we need some historical background. In both Platonic and Christian views, all knowledge is independent of the observer. It is instead objective. And humans simply discover the truth. During the Enlightenment, this changed. Now, humans or the thinking agent can be viewed as the creator of knowledge. Implicit to Lockean empiricism is that knowledge of the external world comes from our subjective sense experience. Having a different configuration for our senses would result in different experiences. Marx had a different view than both of these. While Marx did not have an explicit view of ideology, we can compile his idea through his various writings. He argued that the social identity of the individual altered their experience and therefore their knowledge. Being a materialist, he believed material factors were the causes for all events and phenomena in the world. He further believed that capitalist social reality is a contradiction, as were all previous social realities. In capitalism, there are two classes with divergent interests, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. These clashes would result in conflict. Capitalist ideology solves this contradiction in the mind. Unfortunately, this just hides the true antagonist relationship between the classes by distorting our perception of reality. He called this distortion a false consciousness. This false consciousness is used to compel the proletariat to follow the bourgeoisie by telling them things like everybody should pay their way. However, this falsehood isn't always deliberate. Sometimes it is simply a consequence of the origins of class struggle. Adam Smith, who Marx admired, is an example of this. He believed that Smith was simply explaining economic reality from the bourgeoisie perspective because that was the dominant view of society. Bentham, on the other hand, Marx believed to be an apologist for capitalism. While Marx considered his view as objective and scientific, it must be asked, wouldn't his idea also be created by his experience? If so, isn't it also subjective? Some Marxists today admit his view is also an ideology, but they believe it is closer to reality than others. Marx's view that knowledge was relative to the time, place, and thinker was one expression of skepticism since the Enlightenment. The notion that absolute truth was possible in any field was dismissed, except maybe for the hard sciences. Karl Mannheim based his account of ideology on Marx's ideas, but he rejected Marx's political conclusions. In Mannheim's view, all knowledge was relative, originating in the lives of groups or classes. He believed ideologies to be ideas that are incongruent with reality, which exist to support the status quo. We don't know the full connotation of what he meant by incongruent with reality, but in order to try to come to grasp with that, we would need to answer the question of how ideas relate to material reality. Mannheim differentiated between the particular conception of ideology and the total conception of ideology. The former is a set of ideas that are used to uphold the interests of a particular group and to deceive rival groups. The ideological weapons used by the bourgeoisie are an example of this. Total ideology, on the other hand, is the 
way of thinking in all society or of a particular time period. Modern conceptions of ideology fall into four camps. Instrumental, functionalist, social co cohesion, and symbolic. First, some theorists follow the Marxian view of ideology being an instrument of the ruling class, but apply it to other systems besides capitalist. An example of this would be liberals using it to analyze the Soviet Union. Second, functionalist theories of ideology find it useful for individuals. In this view, all ideologies are a distortion of reality used to compensate for the psychological and epistemological inadequacies of individuals. Accordingly, all these inadequacies can be eradicated in a well-functioning society. The third grouping of views on ideology places the function of ideology on the cohesion of society. It is a means for group solidarity and provides a legitimacy of authority. In the United States, the liberal democratic view that the government is the final arbiter of disputes and that the government gets its legitimacy from the Constitution would be an example. Finally, ideology may perform symbolic functions similar to myths, reconciling the irreconcilable. Clifford Gertz argues that ideology can symbolically formulate scientifically informulable realities and render incomprehensible social situations meaningful. In this case, meaningfulness does not necessarily mean truthfulness. Non-Marxist analysis of ideology share a number of characteristics. First, ideology presents ideas. Second, these ideas purport to have explanatory power. Third, it has a persuasive force. It talks about its ideas as moral imperatives. In many sects of Christianity, homosexuality is morally wrong because God says so causing many to hide their feelings if they are gay or condemn others if they themselves are not. Similarly, in conservative ideology, the idea that border enforcement is necessary to keep the nation persuades many to do things like kick over water in the desert that is left for border crossers. It often claims to be scientific. An example of this is when the Nazis claim that the Aryans are a superior race. Finally, unfortunately, ideology, when analyzed, is often irrational and illogical. This occurs by its selection and omission, interpretation, and often distortion of facts. Frieden's account of ideology comes out of the analytical tradition of philosophy, which aims for conceptual clarity. He concentrates on how words are structured together in language to make meaningful expressions that influence thought behavior by identifying some issues as problems, targeting some actions as solutions, ignoring or marginalizing others and developing group and individual identities. Concepts in Frieden's view cannot be looked at in an, a vacuum. They gain their meanings by their relationship to other concepts within the ideology. As a result, concepts can have very different meanings in different ideologies. For example, liberty within a classical liberal framework means free from interference in using one's property, while within a more left-leaning ideologies, liberty is defined as individuals having security in their economic well-being, giving them the ability to pursue their life as they see fit. These two de definitions may conflict. If a poor person doesn't have food to survive, but has no one preventing them from using their property, property as they see fit, they would be considered free in the former definition, but not free in the latter. Ideological core concepts are historically stable and differentiate the different schools. Surrounding these core concepts reside adjacent and peripheral concepts. Core concepts, while stable, can be moved to the peripheral over time. For instance, during Thomas Hobbes' time, monarchical and authoritarianism was a core concept of conservatism. While today maintaining a representative democracy has pushed monarchy to the background in conservative ideology. Peripheral concepts are detailed and specific. Most of them are significant to the ideology. 
However, some may be marginal. They are historically context-bound and therefore are more open to change, and occasionally they may work their way back to the core. Equal rights of women, as an example, was marginal to liberalism in the 19th century, but is a core feature of it today. Adjacent concepts, on the other hand, help flesh out the core concepts. In modern liberalism, democracy is an adjacent concept as it is considered necessary for liberty, which is a core concept in liberalism. This brings us to Freudian's four P's of conceptual morphology. Proximity refers to how concepts only make sense in relation to the concepts next to them. For example, liberty means something different in Nozickian and Millsian liberalism because the former is tied directly to property rights while the latter is tied to self-development. While both property rights and self-development may exist in both conceptions of liberalism, the proximity they have with liberty differentiates the term. Priority is how important the concept is for that ideology. While environmental sustainability is given some weight in most ideologies, they are weighted differently accordingly. Even within the different schools of anarchism, there are green anarchisms that put significant weight on this concept while others push it to the peripheral. Permeability is in reference to concepts not being fixed nor discrete. For example, the nationalist right has adopted some concepts from anarchism, like anti-capitalism, but have morphed it into anti-Jewish Jewish finance and against international migra migration. Proportionality refers to the extent that core concepts can accommodate others. Core features can expand and push other concepts out of the ideology. Far-right ideologies put so much importance on property that they push equality and other concepts to the peripheral or even out of the ideology completely. Frieden argues that it, that is what happens with, with proprietarian libertarianism and it ends up pushing other concepts to the background, which are important to liberal proper. Frieden's model solves two issues that other models have failed to do. First, it explains why the ideologies adapt and produce different sub-branches while still belong to the same ideological family. Second, it gives a good reason why political concepts have distinct interpretations and different ideologies, which causes them to talk past each other. Frieden's conception of ideology may explain why there is a lot of cross-talk between different ideologies. As already explained, liberty means something different in classical liberalism and in social anarchist systems. Capitalism, socialism, private property, and equality are just some of the very many terms that are used differently within competing ideologies. Each concept within an ideology cannot be viewed in isolation, but must be considered in relation to the other terms within its reasoning. Some theorists believe all political thought is ideological and would group religion in as well. Regardless, if you consider religion an ideology or not, I think this model can help us also explain why theists and atheists cannot agree on what constitutes free will, omnipotence, or morality. While atheism itself is only the answer to a single question, do you believe in a god, and therefore is not an ideology, many atheists subscribe to humanism, or at the very minimum, reject the ideas of religious ideology, so they would have a different ideological view. I have a lot more thoughts on ideology, but this video is already getting long, so I will do a separate video on them. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you soon.